Over the past century, London has been pummeled in two world wars. From the scourge of German airships to the terror of the Blitz, London has never been far away from the front lines. Today the city has been rebuilt, but the scars of war are never far away. I'm Matt McLaughlin. Come with me as I walk the streets of London to find evidence of this violent past. This is London's hidden war history. Steve, what I love so much about London is there is war history all over the city, but you could say it's hidden in plain sight. There's so many places you could walk past and not realise there's a very strong connection to the First or the Second World War. Yeah. And this place really sums it up. We're outside Victoria Station. And just tell us a little bit about what happened here in 1940 and what we can still see as evidence. Well, what we can see here is this lovely battered wall <laughs> that was caused by uh, a German Dornier 17 bomber that was brought down on the 15th of September 1940, the day we now commemorate as Battle of Britain Day. And it hit the station. It came down on the station and here it is, here's the evidence of it right here in front of us. Well, we can see that evidence, can't we? Because this is just, this is just masonry. You would, yep. you would walk past this every day without noticing, but you look closely. We've got huge chunks taken out here all along this section of wall. Oh, wait. It's just devastating. You can see, you can, you can visualise the force of the impact mm. as a German World War II bomber crashed right where we're standing yep. and sent parts of it spraying yep. all over the station. Yep, it was a, a Dornier 17. Um, it had had a bomb load on it as well because the aircraft had actually been damaged in a collision. It was on autopilot. The pilots had uh, abandoned the ship earlier on thinking it was going to come down anyway. Uh, and as it spun down to the ground, it jettisoned some of its bombs, you know, by the centrifugal force of the thing spinning through the air. And actually one of the bombs hit Buckingham Palace, amazingly enough. Okay. Um, which was, you know, made a great propaganda ploy out of that, as you can imagine. Um, but it was one of the few incidents in the Battle of Britain, stroke the Blitz, that was actually being filmed, because I guess it was happening over central London. There was a, a newsreel cameraman taking shots of this thing, and there are shots of this thing actually plummeting down out of the sky. Really quite amazing. And who was the pilot that brought this plane down? The pilot was a Hurricane pilot. He was from 504 Squadron at RAF Hendon, where the, the museum is now located. And his name was Sergeant Ray Holmes. Um, he'd got in position to uh, open fire on the bomber, realised he'd either run out of ammunition or that his guns had just jammed. And in the confusion, he collided with the bomber. Some accounts said that he rammed it deliberately, but I don't think there's any truth in that at all. I don't think anyone in their right mind would do that. He sliced through the tail of the German bomber, crippled his own aircraft in the process as well. Ray lived to tell the tale. He parachuted down and came down uh, over a block of flats on the other side of the station. Um, it's very loosely based, the incident you see in the Battle of Britain movie with Edward Fox where he comes down and obliterates a, a greenhouse. Um, the reality of it wasn't perhaps quite so glamorous that Ray Holmes came down and landed inside a dustbin, <laughs> which was, which was a, you know, I think that's quite a good story for the movie as well. And you've got some, you've got some photos there that show the, the station in the aftermath of, yeah. the, of, the, of the bomber crashing. Let's, let's yeah. just have a look at those. Because so, I can see right where we are. Here's this archway we're standing in front of, mm -hmm. and there is just... There's parts of aircraft, there's damage everywhere. I mean, imagine yeah. the noise, the smoke, the fire. Yeah. Imagine what this was like. And obviously we've got fire wardens and... Fire wardens, you've got an army officer there with a, a nightstick or something there to deter <laughs> souvenir hunters. Because, <laughs> as you probably know, kids were always after souvenirs from crashed German aircraft. But obviously in this situation, um, there was possibly live ammunition still on board. Um, there were certainly the chance that there were uh, bombs still on board. Uh, and sadly, there were two dead crew members on board as well. Um, because before the crew had abandoned it, two of the crew members had actually been killed in the sort of air-to-air -air combat that had run up to this situation. Certainly lots of souvenirs for any would-be souvenir hunter to collect Absolutely, as well. The, the yeah. forecourt here, right where we're standing, 
absolutely strewn, strewn with it, wreckage. Yeah. Do, do you know if anyone was killed on the ground when this plane came in? Nobody killed on the ground, fortunately. It Incredible. happened, despite it happening, just after midday as well. It was quite a busy time. It was a Sunday, uh, but even so, there would have normally been a lot of people around. But um, most people would have been taking shelter either in the tube station here or, you know, in their own homes. But, uh, no, fortunately, nobody on the ground was killed on this occasion. This is a gorgeous red brick building, quite unexpected in all these modern buildings surrounding us right here in the in the heart of Westminster, but um, what's what's the story of this cute little building, Steve? Well, it's, um, yeah, you're right. It is unusual to see something quite like this here. It was a school. It was called Blue Coat School, uh, B-L-E-W Coat, the archaic spelling of it. And you can see the, the young lad there in the, the school uniform with his blue coat. Um, the school was actually founded in 1688, but this building slightly postdates that, 1709. And it was originally built for the poorer children of the borough of Westminster. And of course, walking around Westminster now, it's hard to imagine there being any poor children <laughs> really here now. But uh, obviously in 1709, they were here. And this is who it, who it was built for. It's a, it's a tiny little building. I can't, I can't imagine there were too many pupils are actually housed here. No, I would imagine it would have been quite a, a small affair. There's a downstairs as well. But even so, having been in the building a couple of times, it is quite small. Um, but it's got an interesting past as well. It's not just a school. Um, it had another use during World War II. And there's something I'd like to show you just around the corner. I always love seeing old buildings like this, Steve, dating from the, the 18th, 17th, something in the 16th century. Yeah. Because in London, we've got this incredible architecture, but there's a very strong uh, effect on that architecture because of the Second World War, was it there? Yeah. We see, we often see quite modern buildings mixed in with old buildings. Yeah, absolutely. And that can quite often be a result of bombing during the war. Yeah, invariably. Um, if you're walking along, I know we're not in the suburbs today, but if you're walking along a, a street in the suburbs were full of um, terraced Victorian houses, you quite often see a, a gap with something much more recent in its place. And you can almost put your money on that and say, that's as a result of bomb damage, without even knowing the history of the area. When you get that sort of juxtaposition of Victorian buildings, something newer, back to Victorian buildings, it's almost as certainly as a, a result of bomb damage. Uh, and it's the same around here, you know, you've got a real mixture of old and new. This area wasn't bombed especially heavily, although Victoria Street itself did have a lot of damage, but you've got this real mixture of past and present. Um, and, of course, the buildings that did survive World War II, they had a story to tell as well. Well, this building, I think, is really interesting too because it had a very specific use during the Second World War, didn't it? Tell us about the American involvement with this building. Yeah, um, you know, by obviously by late 1941, the Americans had entered the war. This building had stopped being a school um, between the wars and it was owned by an organisation called the National Trust. Uh, but by 1943, 44, the Americans were using it as a warehouse of all things. They were storing their field equipment here. Um, and obviously there was a very big American presence in, in London and in, in the UK generally. Um, and because it was a military building, albeit a lowly warehouse, it had sentries on guard outside. And the sentries have left their mark that we can still see today. That's pretty fascinating. Show us exactly what, uh, what we can see here left behind by the Americans. Well, I guess they're bored. Maybe they are sharpening them, but these marks in the brickwork, and there's a really good example there and some more there, these are caused by American bayonets. Now, whether they were just sharpening them because they were bored out of their skulls, or whether they were, oh yeah, it's a good place to sharpen them, I don't know. We'll probably never know the answer to that. But you've got all of this on the, the window frames still showing, and I think it's great that the National Trust of recognise that this is just as important a part of the building's history as anything it did when it was a school, and they've never actually restored the brickwork. I think that's brilliant. It would have been a pretty tedious war for those sentries who were posted. Instead of being on the front line, they yeah. found themselves yeah. just guarding a brick building in the heart of London. But you're right, I, I love these aspects of history that yeah. you touch this brickwork. Yeah. And that could be a bit of graffiti there. You know, there's blade marks yeah. here. It might have been their knife, yeah. it might have been their bayonet. 
It's well, just extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Um, you know, on a cold winter's day, what else do you do? We'll yeah. make a bit of mark in the building. And talking of graffiti, um, it's funny you mentioned that, but there is some graffiti in the brickwork here. Um, you can just see the words US Army. US Army. <laughs> yeah. And again, I suspect the gentleman that did that is probably no longer with us, but um, it's great that whoever he was left his mark on London sort of nearly 80 years ago, and uh, it's still here. Is this is graffiti and this sort of leaving your mark, is that something you see commonly in London? Because the reason I ask is having visited a lot of battlefields and historic buildings like this, I find that soldiers in wartime, obviously desperate to not be eradicated mm. from history, they're facing their own death, they're facing the potential loss of their own bodies in the battlefield. They, they, they tend to have this huge desire to leave their mark. Do you see lots mark. of these around London? Um, not quite as dramatic as this in, in public. I've certainly seen it in air raid shelters where people have done little pencil drawings or they've left their signature there and dated it from 1941. There's a couple of private air raid shelters where I've seen that. But um, it's not quite the same, as you say, as, as, as what you see on the battlefield. But it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. It's people leaving their mark in history without, you know, perhaps realising what they were doing. I thought you might be interested in this, Matt, as we're on our way to our next port of call, but uh, this is a lovely old Victorian town hall uh, known as Caxton Hall. Um, and up until 1965, it was the city hall for the borough of Westminster. Um, the civil defence operation would have been controlled from here um, during the whole of the Second World War. Um, and it has got another connection as well. It's almost impossible to do any sort of talk or walk around wartime London without mentioning the name of this man at least once. So, as you can see, Winston Churchill, wartime prime minister from 1940 onwards. Um, we're in Westminster. We're very close to Downing Street, to the seat of government in uh, the Houses of Parliament. And Winston gave quite a few of his wartime speeches here. I can't tell you specifically which ones, but he would have given many of his wartime speeches because he was a great man for being seen, getting out, getting the message across, and what better place than doing it on his own doorstep? Was that a, was that a key part of his strategy during the war to boost morale, was to be seen, to be out amongst the people? I think certainly during the Blitz of 1940 to 41, he wanted to be seen to still be in London. Um, people didn't want him to be... Uh, cowering somewhere in a bunker, which he would never have done, I don't think. It wasn't in his nature. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of the old newsreel footage that whenever there was a bad incident, perhaps in the West End or in the East End of London, rather, he would be there. He would be there first on the scene, inspecting the damage, quite often with the King and Queen, just being out there and showing people that he cared. Um, which was in marked contrast to someone like Hitler, you know, that uh, when Hamburg was bombed, for example, in 1943, um, I think many of the Nazi leadership implored Hitler to go and see what was going on in Hamburg, and he didn't want to know. He remained very aloof. So that was one of the huge differences. Churchill wanted to be seen. He wanted people to know that he cared, and uh, he wanted to be visible. Here we are, we're in Queen Anne's Gate, and it's a lovely little quiet backwater. And many beautiful, people, beautiful yeah, little street. Beautiful little street. Many people don't realise London has still got little quiet streets like this. And the joy of walking along streets like this is that it does have the occasional surprise in store. Um, hiding in plain sight is some wartime history, which I don't know if you've spotted or not. I did see this as we came up. I'm hoping this is a famous London World War II air raid shelter site. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's um, Obviously, it's a bit faded over the passing of 80 plus years, but it is a shelter sign. Um, it would have had a large letter S, as you can see, an arrow pointing downwards and the word shelter. The paintwork would have been a bit brighter, but it's fairly low key, 
for what it was. Um, the shelters, incidentally, would have just been literally beneath our feet in the, uh, the vaults underneath the houses. Um, and there is another sign, again, hiding in plain sight just a few doors along, which might be of interest as well. With these shelters, Steve, I mean, how did they choose where they were going to be? Were they spread out throughout the city? Was there, obviously, their policies controlling how and sure. where they would place these shelters? Sure. Um, well, before I answer that, I'll just show you, again, the sign up there. That's, if anything, is even more faded, that one. Um, the words on it just say, public shelters in vaults, under pavements, in this street. So, again, unless you're walking around sort of looking upwards, it's not that easy to spot. Um, but to answer your question, um, public shelters were located across London, certainly the central part of London especially. Um, the fact that you've got the signage indicates it's a public shelter available for anyone to use. These would have been very basic ones here, uh, would have been literally for someone to dive into if you're unlucky enough to be out when the air aid warning sounded. You dive down there and at least you could get away from the worst of the, the bombs and the flying debris until such time as it had died down and you could either then make a dash for home or for a tube station where the sheltering was a little bit more substantial. Um, or, you know, if you could get away completely, then, then do so. The shelters were, in central London, very much tube station oriented, as you can imagine. You've probably all seen the famous photographs of people sheltering on tube platforms. And a little bit further along the walk today, we'll actually visit um, a closed tube station which was used as a shelter and we can hear a personal account as to what it was like to spend a night in these places. Um, obviously in central London there weren't that many people that had houses big enough to have the, the famous Anderson shelter in their back garden. Um, so they had to make do with public shelters like this with things called Morrison shelters which were essentially steel top dining room tables that you could hide underneath and hope for the best. Uh, tube station shelters, of course, uh, and the brick built public shelters that were built at surface level. So it was very rudimentary in the centre of London, uh, but people would largely have relied on public shelters like this or on spending the night on the tube. I think it's incredible, Steve, that the, the words painted on this brickwork they're, they're fairly innocuous, they're, they're just some, you know, fairly unobtrusive, easy. I, I, I bet thousands of people walk past here every day and don't realise they're there, yeah. but what they represent, the fear. Imagine you were running down this street, bombs are falling, you yeah. hear the air raid sirens going, yes. and this was your only point of salvation. Yeah. Just, just what these represent, yeah. and that chapter of absolute terror in London during the Blitz, it's, it's quite extraordinary and it's so important they're preserved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you've painted a very vivid picture there. You can imagine hearing the bombs perhaps exploding somewhere in the far distance or the sirens sounding and you think, I've got to get somewhere. I've got to give myself a chance to some sort of shelter. Um, so, yeah, it's very important. There are quite a few of these dotted around in various parts of Westminster. Um, it's good that they've survived. It's good that they've been preserved. Um, and it's also a good testament to the quality of 1940s paint manufacturers as well, that it survived all this time. But, uh, yeah, I love seeing stuff like this. And, uh, yeah, it's always a, um, satisfactory when you bump into them and just find them for the first time. Wow, this is a spectacular memorial. Steve, I haven't been here before, but this is the relatively new Battle of Britain Memorial down on the river, not far from, from Westminster. I mean, it's a, it's a magnificent memorial. Yeah. Um, yes, it's the Victoria Embankment. This has only been here since... 2005 so it is relatively recent and it's a very striking memorial well let's break down the elements that, that make up the memorial steve i mean obviously the focal point is is scramble the the pilots running to their aircraft when the uh, when the siren's been sounded right at us yeah and i think it's great you've got that but obviously the art, artwork also recognizes very much the other people involved it wasn't just about the pilots so they're obviously they were the most important part but you've got the, the backroom staff, you've got the girls plotting in the ops room, you've got the, uh, the armourers arming the plane, you've got the observer corps there, the guys with their binoculars, and then you've got the pilots at rest, you know, waiting for the next scramble, for their next shout. So I think this is, you know, really, really nice piece of art, and it encapsulates the period really well 
in just a few short pieces of, uh, of artwork. What I really like about it, Steve, is it demonstrates that collective effort. And that's what the Battle of Britain was all about. Yeah. It wasn't just about the Spitfire taking on the Luftwaffe. No. It was a collective effort. It, this shows all the people who were involved in the process, but not just that. There's names all over the memorial yes. from all Commonwealth and, and from not just Commonwealth countries, from all the countries who sent pilots to fly in the Battle of Britain. And this is listing thousands of pilots yeah, who yeah. flew combat missions Absolutely. during the Battle of Britain. And there's names from Barbados. There's names from Australia, obviously. New yeah. Zealand, there's a very big New Zealand contingent. Yeah. A lot of Polish flyers, yes. as you'd expect, but some unexpected ones too, like the US. The US. There are American pilots here. Remember, this is a year before more than a year before America yeah. even entered the war. So it, it tells an absolutely extraordinary story about the collective effort that was the Battle of Britain. Indeed, it does. You've got all those countries mentioned. And I think the other good thing about it, obviously it's remembering those who lost their lives, but all of the names that are on there are those pilots that flew during the Battle of Britain, whether they survived or whether they lost their lives. What I really like about this memorial, Steve, is it's, it's effectively in two halves. Mm. Just here, we've got the, the combat story, we've got the depictions of the soldiers, but over here, this panel really tells the civilian experience. And, and Very much so. Because the, the, the Blitz and the Battle of Britain are really inescapable. They, they were hand in hand. And this panel is talking about the experience for the people who weren't up in the air, but were on the ground. Absolutely right, yeah. I mean, obviously, you've still got the airmen in the centre there. They were the guys at the, the core of it all. But over here, you've got members of the public looking up at the sky, you know, wondering what's going on. It was with terror, looking up with terror. With a certain amount of terror and with a certain amount of wonderment on the children's <laughs> part. You know, it was a bit of an adventure for some of them. Um, and there you've got the German bombers dropping their bombs, anti-aircraft gunners, quite rightly, one of them holding his ears. You've got a gun firing there, and then it moves further along. And we've got women here working in munitions factories and we can't we can't underestimate the importance of this. We've got, well, repairs on aircraft, munitions factories. Yeah. I mean, they, these, these ladies appear to be manufacturing aircraft, and we cannot forget the importance of the civilians who work in industry and the contribution of women. This was, a very, this was a very important time for women to step forward and, yeah. and, and, and a, a very a pivotal moment in, in world history. Yeah, it was very much, it was a game changer for women's employment. There were jobs that suddenly became available uh, to women that had never even been considered possible for them to, to do. Um, and they not only stepped up to the plate and did it, but they did the job really, really well. Such an important contribution. Very important. Yeah. And as we, as we move along, we've got the Hurricane, or well, BF-109, the Messerschmitt, the, yeah. obviously the Spitfire, we can't go without the Spitfire. But then I love this, we've got that iconic image yeah. of St Paul standing defiantly shrouded in smoke. I mean, yeah. how did it survive? That incredible photograph of the, of the domes, you know, yeah. uh, uh, bursting out of a cloud of smoke as London burnt around it. Yeah. Beautifully captured by the sculptor here. I mean, we've, we've seen the photograph. I think we spoke about it in our previous, in our previous documentary. documentary. That's right. And uh, yeah, it was an amazing sight. And uh, it was a photograph that was sent around the world to show that we were still here, you know, that Britain was uh, surviving and was defiant. Uh, you move along a bit further, you've got the air raid wardens. These guys are obviously involved in some sort of rescue work. Judging by the expression on his face, you've got rescue workers here in the in the background. The devastated buildings devastated burning. Devastated and... buildings. Doesn't it look, even the, the marks here give the impression of fire and yeah. smoke wafting up from the burning buildings. Very, very well done. And then, of course, perhaps a bit of a cliche, but right at the very end, you've got the British public cracking on, having a cup of tea, which was the universal panacea. You know, you have a cup of tea and everything's good. Keep calm and carry on. That's Something like that, yeah. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I, I, I don't want to be unkind, but to me, modern war memorials often, in my opinion, don't match up to, mm. to the ones that were, were cast soon after the war. This is a big exception. Yeah. It's been done so well. It captures all the elements. Yeah. It captures the necessary heroism and glory of those pilots and mm. what they did up there, but it doesn't overlook everyone else involved. And there were hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people who were involved in winning this yeah. vitally important battle. Yeah, and I really, I agree with you. And again, I think the most, the famous words of, of the man himself, of Winston Churchill, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Um, the pilots were a relatively small number of very heroic, very brave men, uh, and the many, were those, you know, my ancestors, your 
your ancestors, those people on the ground. Um, it was a big thing. It was a big thing. Real turning point in the war. We're at the memorial known as Cleopatra's Needle, and it's a, it's a wonderful representation of ancient Egypt, erected in the time of Queen Victoria. But that's not why we're here. We're here for this damage to the base and, and to this lion here, which it's obviously bomb damage, Steve. If I saw bomb damage in London, I'd go Second World War, Battle of Britain, the Blitz. But this isn't from the Second World War at all, is it? No, this predates it. This is from a previous conflict. It's from the First World War. Um, and if I said First World War, you might be mistakenly thinking Zeppelin raid, something like that. This actually comes from a Gotha raid from the time when the Zeppelin raids had largely ceased and the German Air Force decided to start bombing London with large biplane bombers called Gothas. Uh, and this actually was the first nighttime raid on London of a Gotha bomber. Um, the plaques got it slightly wrong when they say it was the first raid on London by any German aeroplane. That's not quite right. It was a nighttime raid. Um, and it was quite a devastating one in terms of the loss of life, bearing in mind that civilians had got used to the fact that wars were something that happened a long way away from home. And it was something you read about in your newspaper the next day or a few days later. All of a sudden, with the onset of the Zeppelin raids and then the Gotha raids, Londoners found themselves in the front line, very much so. So just to talk through this history, the Germans, in a precursor to what would happen in the Second World War, decided to attack London. First, as you say, in large airships called Zeppelins mm -hmm. that bombed not just London, but a number of centres up and down up and down the coast. Yeah. Uh, but then they actually developed a biplane which was capable of flying from France to England. Yeah. And as we said, in a precursor to the Blitz, a, a couple of decades later, began a campaign of bombing London uh, and civilian targets. Very much so. Um, and it's funny how the lessons that were learned in the Blitz had to be learned a first time around that the Germans made the same mistake that, that the British and the Americans made, that the Germans themselves made during the, the Blitz. They thought that they could bomb London by sheer weight of bombers alone without any escort. And they did the same thing in World War I. They tried their luck bombing London by day um, and they lost too many aircraft. It was too costly, so they switched to nighttime bombing. This was the first nighttime raid on London. Um, so it's strange how, in the space of a few short years, those tactics have been forgotten. They thought that the World War II bombers would be uh, able to defend themselves without a fighter escort during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. That wasn't the case. Um, the British thought that they could do the same bombing Germany by day and learn the hard way. Um, so it's funny how certain lessons don't sink in at the time. How did the British rep uh, public respond to coming under attack like this? Well, it was something completely new to them. Um, they found themselves, again, in a, a precursor of what we'd see during the Blitz. They found themselves sheltering in underground stations. They found themselves um, beginning to wonder what was going to happen that night. You know, would there be a raid that night? Were they going to get through? So, yeah, it was a new experience for Londoners. Civilians weren't involved in wars up until that point, really, and uh, it was a, a real eye-opener for them. And I think you've got an account of someone who was involved in these raids. I have, yeah, it's a, it's a very short account. Um, unfortunately, in this incident, there was um, the loss of human life involved, one of which was a tram driver. This little roadway here used to be tram tracks running past. Um, and it's a guy called Joseph Carr, who was the conductor on the tram that was hit. And he said that his driver, a guy called Alfred Buckle, he felt very uneasy and he was keen to get his shift over. And he actually asked if he could move off in front of another tram. And as they proceeded along the Victoria embankment, they could hear the sound of bombs exploding nearby in the strand. Um, he was keen to get moving. He accelerated, but just as he passed Cleopatra's needle, uh, the bomb exploded on the pavement here between the tram and the statue. The blast smashed through the pavement, it destroyed the gas main, and it damaged the base of the needle, as we can see here. Um, sadly, the tram driver was killed. He had like, both of his legs blown off in the raid, and also two passengers on the tram lost their lives as well. 
Um, eight passers-by were injured, and one eyewitness said that the, dra the tram driver, Mr Buckle, he appeared to kneel down suddenly while still pulling at his controls. I saw him fall and then realised that his legs had been blown off. So, a tragic story, um, but one that will be repeated many times, not only during the subsequent raids in the First World War, but obviously something that Londoners will get much more used to in the following conflict. It's a very emotive quote, Steve, you've just read, but the, the other thing that strikes me about this is the bomb fell not far from the memorial, but look at the damage it's done. They, I, this is, to me, such a visceral demonstration of the damage bombing can do to a city. And isn't it remarkable that it's been maintained? Not only has it been maintained, but a plaque has been affixed to the sculpture, yeah. pointing out why there's so much damage to it. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of foresight in that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of understanding on the part of the authorities about yeah. what this meant to the people of London. No, absolutely. Um, I think when people started getting killed, obviously that really brought things home to them. Uh, and bear in mind, this was only a small bomb. This was only a 50 kilo bomb. It's very small beer by World War II standards. So, as you say, close range. Obviously, the bomb only exploded just over in the road there. But if it can cause that sort of damage, a small 50 kilo bomb, it really shows you the sort of stuff that, uh, you know, the World War II calibre of bombs could achieve. I also think it's very poignant that obviously this memorial was erected. The plaque was put up here immediately after the First World War, long before anyone knew what was going to occur during the Second World War. No, and it's really. quite chilling that the damage to this memorial prompted the people of London to say, well, we have to remember this occurred. And, yeah. and only a matter of years later, the entire city would be coming under fire. Absolutely, yeah, very much so. It's quite, um, quite prescient in a way, isn't it, that they put the plaque there at that time. Uh, and then, as you say, just a few short years later, it's all happening again. I saw this the first time I came to London. I came here and I saw this, and to a kid from the bush in Australia, actually seeing damage that had been caused during a world war was one of the most incredible experiences I'd had up to that point. I'd always been interested in war history, but here I could actually touch damage done touch it. By, uh, by bombs during a war. And I think that's the important thing. And those of us in Australia, or perhaps in America, or more isolated from this experience, mm. This is what brings it home to us. Yeah. Even, even decades later, we can walk the ground, we can see this damage. Yeah. More than a century later, we can see this damage yeah. and just appreciate what it meant to the people of London. Yeah, absolutely. And we tend to take it a little bit for granted here, you know. Um, it's because it's always been here in my lifetime. But yeah, I can, I can totally understand that, but it must be quite something to see it if you've never seen it before. We've been talking all day that we're never that far away from wartime history in London. And right behind me here, we've got a relic from the Battle of the Atlantic here in the centre of London. Uh, she's now known as HQS, Headquarters Ship Wellington. And she's the headquarters of the Worshipful Company of Master Mariners. But she was once HMS Wellington. She was a, a convoy escort ship. She was something that was known as a sloop, uh, built in 1934. Um, and served on many a North Atlantic convoy as an escort. Um, I think she has one U-boat to her credit. <laughs> um, and she was also, she wasn't at Dunkirk, but she was at some of the subsequent evacuations uh, following Dunkirk from places like La Havre and Cherbourg. Um, so she's a ship with a history um, and she's still serving in her own way. I love that story, that's brilliant. I mean, we don't normally associate London with the Battle of the Atlantic. You know, down at Southampton and Portsmouth, there's wonderful memorials and reminders of the Battle of the Atlantic, but that, that's incredible. She's tied it right here. It's what we've been talking about all day, yeah. the hidden history. Thousands of people are walking past this every day and not knowing. Yeah. Thousands of people who would be interested in the wartime history if they, uh, if they knew. If I so knew. I, I love that, that what we've discovered today is history unfolding in, the, in the, the, the smallest little corners of London. Yeah, I thought you'd be interested. It's something that uh, just came to mind as we were walking down. And as you say, the number of people that must walk past, cycle past, jog past, whatever, and they don't realise that you've got that wartime, that tangible wartime history still here right in the centre of London. So here we are at uh, St Clement Danes Church. Um, it's a Christopher Wren church. It dates from 1685. Um, and up until 1941, it was just a normal parish church in London. 
Uh, it's obviously it's now the Royal Air Force Central Church, but we'll talk about that in a while. Um, this church was pretty well gutted on the night of the 10th, 11th of May, 1941, which proved to be the, the heaviest raid of the Blitz, as well as being the last raid of the Blitz. Um, got a, a photograph here, which gives you a, a good idea as to the, the state of the damage. Uh, on the night, the incendiary bombs caught the whole building on fire. Um, and by the following morning, it was gutted. It was just the, the four walls and the bell tower were the only things surviving. It's absolute devastation, isn't it, Steve? And this, this church historically is believed to be the famous St. Clement's from the nursery rhyme, the yes. oranges, or, oranges and lemons. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. So yeah. it's, 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 again, it's these chapters of history being drawn together during the Second World War and to tell a pretty, uh, pretty tragic story, judging from that photo. Yeah, it is a tragic story. Um, the, the vicar of the church at that time was a guy by the name of William Pennington Bickford, good old British double-barreled <laughs> name. And he'd been here for a number of years, since about 1910, 1912, something like that. And he was absolutely devoted to the church and his parishioners. And on the night that the church was uh, being destroyed, he could be seen standing on the opposite corner over there with tears pouring down his face. And within a few weeks of the church being destroyed, um, he died as well. And he actually took his own life, which was quite something for a clergyman. Um, and his death certificate tells a little white lie, which is rather touching. It says he died from a broken heart, which I guess isn't a million miles from the truth, really. But um, the church had obviously an interesting history prior to the war and had so afterwards as well. So tell, tell me about the, re, uh, the repurposing of this historic church after the Second World War. Yeah, well, in um, immediately the years following the war, the idea was floated that the Royal Air Force, it was the youngest, it is the youngest of the three British services. It was the world's first independent air force formed on the 1st of April 1918. It didn't have its own dedicated church. Obviously, the army has many regimental churches. The Royal Navy has its own churches. The RAF didn't have one. So the idea was floated to take a bombed out church close to the air ministry, which used to be located just up the road there in the Aldwych, um, and repurpose it, rebuild it, restore it to become the central church of the Royal Air Force. That was achieved in 1956, that when it was uh, re-consecrated, and it is now known as the central church of the Royal Air Force. Well, the church has a fascinating World War II story, Steve, and I think there's just around the corner some fairly visceral evidence of that World War II story, isn't there? Yeah, there certainly is. Would you like to come and have a look at Let's it? Let's go and have a look. Wow, that's some uh, pretty significant damage to the exterior of the church, Steve. I mean, I know we already said that the church was completely gutted during that last big attack of the first stage of the Blitz, but... Yeah. I tell you what, mate, there's nothing that brings it home like seeing that damage here. You can, you can literally see where bombs have exploded and, and shards have sprayed. sprayed. I mean, they call it splash or spray, and you can see why. It looks like, yeah. it looks like water's been splashed across the side of the church. Just, just extraordinary. Yes. Extraordinary this is still here. Tell me about that raid and, and the effect that that had on the yeah. church and on London. Well, it was the, the night of the 10th, 11th of May, 1941. It proved to be the last raid of the Blitz. Londoners didn't know that at the time, but obviously Hitler was looking to attack the Soviet Union and he needed his Luftwaffe resource uh, to support that attack. Um, it was also the heaviest raid of what we call the Night Blitz or the First Blitz. Um, quite small beer in comparison with the RAF and American raids on Germany later in the war, but by Blitz standards, it was significant. Um, it was something in the region of 450 aircraft, dropped 1,400 tonnes of bombs, and probably, I think the figure quoted is about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 incendiary bombs. So a significant amount of uh, bombs that were dropped. So again, it was the heaviest loss of life in a single raid during the Blitz. And one eyewitness at the time, uh, who was a, a post office engineer working on repairing the telephone lines, he made the comment, he said, there was never a raid like it. He said, had there been another one, they'd have had us on our backs. 
Um, it was a night when significant damage was done not only to the regular everyday buildings of London, but also the infrastructure. By the following morning, there was only one of London's main railway terminus stations still in operation. Um, the transport network, the underground network was paralysed. Um, the road network was paralysed. And although it was recovered and things were put right in a relatively short space of time, it was significant, more significant damage than had been caused in any single raid um, previously. It's a, uh, it's a great uh, credit to the British people that they were able to carry on, that the British, the British morale never wavered, that they, that they continued the fight in the face of what is a devastating raid. Yeah, absolutely. And the following night, people were fully expecting another raid. They were sort of rolling their sleeves up thinking, here we go again, they'll be back tonight. And to everybody's great relief, they didn't come back. Um, there were a few attacks on cities outside London, but London itself didn't have any meaningful raids on it until 1943, when the, the so-called tip-and-run raid started. But they were never in any way as intense as, as this particular raid in the Blitz. I think what happened to this church sums up pretty neatly the nature of the raids during the Blitz and the battles and the, and the, and the, the, the attacks and the way buildings were damaged. Because we typically think of huge high explosive bombs blowing up and toppling buildings and even though that did occur this is pretty typical where bombs perhaps damaged the roof and then incendiaries came in and yeah. set fire to the yeah. buildings and obviously in the uh, this this applied all across europe mm. that these particularly these more ancient cities that uh, there's a lot of timber that you know the the buildings were old the structures were easily damaged by fire the yeah. the incendiary bombing of these cities was was absolutely devastating yeah. wasn't it well when you think of these churches, predominantly timber, apart from the, the walls, but the rest of the buildings, predominantly timber. The roof goes, the interior goes, because again, you've got even more timber involved there. It's just fuel for fires. And you can understand why, as you say, in German cities later on, you can understand why you had these firestorms where they just became uncontrollable. It's, it's horrific. And this is a really important reminder of it right here on the side of this church. Absolutely. And it's somewhat ironic um, that it's now the RAF church. And of course, the RAF were instrumental in doing similar sort of damage to, to German cities. It's a wonderful piece of history. I'm, I'm very glad it's been maintained. Absolutely, yeah. Steve, after a big day of touring historic sites, we want to jump on the tube and head home or to the nearest pub. But I don't think we're going to get too far with the uh, tube station <laughs> behind us. What's, what's happening here? Yeah, I don't think we're going to get too far, as you say. Um, this is the old Aldwych tube station. It used to be a little branch line that just ran up and down, up and down between here and Hoban. Um, if you've got your transport geeks hat on, which I always <laughs> have, um, this is a, a classic Leslie Green station. Leslie Green was the underground's retained architect around about the turn of the 19th, 20th century. And his stations have all got this classic, what they call oxblood tile, uh, which is a lovely, lovely identification of uh, the old classic London tube stations. Are there many of these tube stations still remaining, still in use? Because I haven't seen one that looks like this. Yeah, there are a few, um, mainly in central London, mainly on the Piccadilly line, uh, not exclusively, but you will see a few of them. I think Knightsbridge is one Next time you're shopping in Harrods, that's a good one to, uh, to look out for. It's not just that this, though, is an interesting piece of history in its own right. It has a fascinating Second World War history, doesn't it? It has indeed. Um, because this was, as I mentioned, a little shuttle service that just ran up and down, it wasn't ever that well used, even in World War II or prior to World War II. Um, and in September 1940, the station was closed and it became a full-time air raid shelter. Um, the idea being that it could accommodate something in the region of between 2,500 to 5,000 people. Um, it was used as a shelter both here and at the Hoban end. And at the Hoban end, they also used it to store artefacts from the British Museum, such as the Elgin marbles were kept down there for a certain amount of time. So it has got a fascinating history, and it does feature in a classic wartime book as well called Bomber's Moon, written by an American correspondent called James Negley Farson. One of the things that I think is fascinating about this is, we've discussed this before, but the idea that 
it wasn't necessarily condoned in the early days, the idea that the public would be sheltering in tube stations. Is that, uh, you know, tell, tell us that part of the story and about the, the, the relationship between people just improvising and using shelters and then the official uh, policy of having people kept down there. Yeah, uh, at the outset of the war, it was definitely official government policy that the public were not allowed to use tube stations. Um, the British people, when the Blitz started, the British people got round it in a very British way. And they did so by going to the ticket office, buying a ticket to the next station, and then just simply refusing to get on a train. And there is nothing in the London Transport Bylaws that says if you buy a ticket that you have to travel. So people just made their own rules, went down to the, the stations with their ticket. They weren't breaking any rules. And then they just said, you know what, we're not going anywhere. The British government, the th reasoning behind it was probably they thought that people would become cave dwellers. They thought they would go down into the tube stations and basically never come out again. But they very quickly realised that people didn't want to spend the entire night on a tube station if they could help it. As soon as the all clear sounded, people were coming up and going about their business. So combined with, with that realisation and combined with the fact that people were going to do their thing anyway, they very quickly changed the policy and allow people to use uh, underground stations as air raid shelters. I think the thing we can't quite get our heads around at this far removed, Steve, is what that experience was actually like for people. It's one thing to say there's hundreds of people gathered in the tube station, yeah. but it's another thing to see it and to hear about it, and you've got some examples of uh, what it was actually like. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I've got a, a photograph here, which is this very station. This is the Aldwych tube station. Um, soon after, I would suggest soon after they made it official that you could use the stations. But I think the best way to describe that scene is perhaps one of organised chaos. <laughs> um, you've got, obviously, they've switched the current off on the track, so the, there's no danger of being electrocuted or run over by a train, but you have got people literally crouching and sleeping everywhere. There's no sign of toilet facilities, there's no sign of bunk beds, there's no sign of anything really other than the police officers making sure people uh, retain a certain amount of order. Uh, it certainly doesn't look comfortable. That's the first thing I'd say about it. It certainly doesn't look comfortable. But to the authorities' credit, what they did within a very short space of time, the stations that were selected for use as shelters were given steel bunk beds on the platforms. They were given a first aid post on each station. Um, there were refreshments available in the shape of teas and coffees and sandwiches if you needed them. And perhaps more importantly, out of the lot, they installed chemical toilets on every station. Um, but I do have a personal account from a book called Bomber's Moon by an American author called James Negley Farson. And he really sums up quite vividly what it was like to, to be on a tube station in those early days of the Blitz. And if I may, I'd love to read it. Please do. Well, it was quite a scene for a dark, damp, smelly tube with an open, gent's latrine staring you in the face. Lest I be accused of painting a picture, this was the Aldwych tube. The position of the bucket latrine used by the men was some 10 feet from the stone steps at the end of the platform. And I'll take a chance and swear on it that there will be plenty of witnesses who come forward and swear that the only veil that covered it from public view at that date were two torn strips of burlap with a jagged, unclosable gap between them of at least 18 inches from top to bottom. As one woman shelter put it, we had a free public view. <laughs> I mean, what can you say about that? Yeah. Stoic is the word Stoic, that I would yeah. use. Stoic, which sums up the attitude throughout the Blitz. I know the whole Blitz spirit thing is a little bit overplayed, that it wasn't the case, that every person in London was defiant to the end. But I've got to say, you hear stories like that. It does demonstrate that the people were, uh, were going above and beyond. Yeah, I think so too. And it's a, a great story perhaps to close our proceedings for today. On. In, a, in a great spot. In, in a great of, spot. One of the old tube. Wonderful.